Hello, hello, friends. Welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Paco Siller, and I'm like, I'm here with my new friend, Jordan Roach. Jordan, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Paco. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited for this live stream. We're going to be getting into some uh, Premiere Pro editing. We're going to do a very, we're going to see a very cool video that you just made uh, for the purposes of, the, of this live stream. So I'm super excited to get into it. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Uh, let me do some intro remarks real quick and then we'll get back to business. Um, so real quick, just want to make sure to let everybody know that we are live. So I am looking at the YouTube and Behance chat. So if you have any questions at all throughout this live stream, go ahead and shout it out in the comments because that's why we're live so we can interact with you. So do not hesitate to save space. Any questions whatsoever during the live stream with Premiere Pro or video editing, go ahead and ask either Jordan or myself. And also while we're at it, Go ahead and hit that subscribe button to our YouTube channel. There's going to be a bit.ly link popping up right underneath me. There it is. So go ahead and uh, pop in that bit.ly to your address bar and give us a uh, subscribe or a follow if you're not doing so already. Um, but all right, enough about me and what these housekeeping items are. Uh, Jordan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do in your professional world? Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, my name is Jordan. I am a full-time freelance video creator. And by video creator, I don't mean I'm a TikTok dancer. I use that term to kind of describe the fact that I take a lot of projects from pre-production, through production, through post-production. And these projects are usually smaller scale projects and things that you can do with basically like crews of one person to 10 people max. Um, I started off going down the route towards cinematography in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I thought that cinematography was kind of the heart of filmmaking itself. And so I wanted to always have that camera in my hands and be learning about like the tools of um, lighting and composition um, in a way that uh, was able to tell stories and make people connect with the content that you were sharing. I also grew up making a lot of art. And so knowing that I wanted to have a career in the real world, um, instead of be behind a computer screen my whole life, I chose cinematography. And so I actually started off um, as a camera production assistant intern for Portlandia. And so this was a while back, oh, but that's yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, you know, the first internship. Um, and so that's what like got me into the Portland scene. It was incredibly important to do that internship because this, this field is all about who, you know, and so I started be doing more assistant camera work. And so that was really great to have that experience to be on those larger sets, but as an assistant camera, I wasn't totally creatively fulfilled. It's a very technical role. And so I, at a certain point, decided to leave behind larger scale productions and buy my first camera and just start doing very small projects um, on like very small budgets. And so, you know, there would be a musician who said, hey, can we come make this music video? And I'd be like, yes. Or this brand who needed an interview video or a brand video. And I'd be like, yes, I can do that. And so slowly just made a ton of mistakes. And those are the greatest gifts you have, like when you're growing and learning in this field. And so, you know, I've started working on more technically advanced concepts. And during COVID, I had to stay inside a lot. And so um, that's when I really started um, working on a lot of editing projects. And so I got that full view of the filmmaking process from being out in the fields and having the experience um, being around the larger scale productions and knowing how um, the camera world works. And then also being able to take what you've shot and now turn that into a story in the editing room. And so right. I, yeah. What Paco? No, I said, right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. No, and I just, I just want to plus one, what you said about the best way to learn is by making mistakes. I mean, I think we live in a beautiful world where you could be self-taught in a lot of things. And, uh, you know, the biggest, uh, lesson teacher is actually just 
starting to apply the things that you learn on YouTube University or wherever it is, or live streams, Adobe Live, and then actually going out there and learning and making mistakes as you learn. So yeah, I want to echo all those sentiments. Very, very, very true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, your mistakes and also valuing uh, the mentors that you have yes, access to mentors. in your journey. Yeah, That's yeah. A big one. Yeah. And the people who are like, okay, when you're first starting off, you don't have a lot of experience. So your expectations are low. Take advantage of those opportunities too, because um, sure. those low expectations, like you're like, even if your mom says, Hey, I need this video, you take that. And no matter what, she's going to love what you make. So just yeah. go out there and make something. Um, Agreed. Cool. Yeah. Well, speaking of making something, um, do we kind of want to hop into what it is that we're going to be working on today? Yeah. So today I um, was took this opportunity to think about making a short film that I could make using only myself as the crew and frankly um, myself as the talent, which is the first for me, um, and also any resources that I had free access to. And so oftentimes, like in filmmaking, it's you are really limited um, to doing this kind of stuff or you think you are because you often think that you need like, you know, a full crew, cast, locations, a budget. And the truth is that if you're a videographer or even if you're someone with an iPhone and you have access to Premiere Pro, there is so much you can do and um, the effects and the possibilities within Premiere when you start to learn um, how you can use those tools um, can be uh, a very, cre can un like unlock a lot of um, creativity that you didn't think was there. And so a small amount of backstory for the short film that I'm about to show you is that um, I shot all this basically on a camera and a tripod. I thought about a story that was important to me and affecting me personally. And basically it came out of the fact that one night I was working late at night and I was very stressed out. I had my phone out, my computer out, um, the TV was on in the background and um, I just wasn't very happy, you know, like that's a lot of sensory input. And at the same time, my dog was asleep. So he was just sleeping through the whole thing. None of this stuff matters to him. And so I put him into the film and said, okay, like the things that are important to us are not actually important in the larger um, view of life. And so that's kind of the context of what I'm about to show you. This is a very artsy piece and I made all of the sound effects as well. So just um, so cool. know that. All right, here we go. Okay. Well, thanks for teeing screen. it up to us. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and watch this short film, and then I'm going to go ahead and mute this, all right? So go ahead and play, Jordan, and then we will come back to chat once we're finished watching it. It's about three and a half minutes, so go ahead and queue it up whenever you're ready. Okay, here we go.
So that so was So cool. It. Jordan, I love that. That was so awesome. And I, and I love how you teed it up saying that this is just tools that you have at your disposal. You know, you don't need anything super fancy or black magic or an RM. I and mean, this is something that you made. And, you know, I mean, you could argue that the story, the narrative is the most important part uh, when it comes to shooting something. And, uh, yeah, I mean, just to let everybody know, I haven't seen it either. This is the first time I was seeing it with you all. And it was great. I love the sound effects, the music at the end. Uh, yeah, it was, it hit. It was good. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. I really liked it. Yeah. And so it's just like, it is definitely more of an experimental piece. And so what I wanted to do was see how we can use effects to perspective hop and like jump between different viewpoints. And so that's what I took this as like a, a challenge to do. So like, you know, a dog would see a world through just desaturated blues and yellows, and we can do that in Premiere. Um, I tried to show how a fly would see the world um, that would be blurry, black and white, and it can be, uh, you know, you see their eyes, they're close to like a 360 degree view. And now there's science showing that plants might just see blurry outlines of light and dark. And so, and then trees can also like, every time they get touched, they feel that. And so the, the research is very cool. It's very evolving though. So, and there's a lot of disagreement on um, these things, and, but there's still a, a very cool fusion of science and art that, that makes me really excited to be a part of filmmaking. So it's awesome. Um, I, I love that term perspective hop. And uh, yeah, I think you did that really well with the effects and the different perspectives that we're seeing, whether it's the dog or the fly. So yeah, very cool term. I haven't heard that. <laughs> I probably, yeah, it's probably somewhere, but I think, you know, it, it might've made it up. Um, but yeah, I would be happy to jump into Premiere if that yeah, would be. Yeah, let's fire up Premiere. Okay. Yeah, let's fire up Premiere and then uh, kind of see behind the scenes on how this was made. Uh, and again, we are live. So if anybody has any questions or um, any common suggestions, go ahead and post them in the chat, which I'm looking at. Um, I see Nick, Nicholas there. I see Jack. I see Robert. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, any questions, holler. And then when it's appropriate, I'll try and interject those questions. So, all right, we're here in Premiere, Jordan. So what are we looking at? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the first step of every project is organizing um, your project panel. And so what I like yes. to do is, yeah, have a sequence file. Um, I have my original sequences, but I also made um, some kind of tutorial sequences here that I'll be going through today. But in general, you know, everybody has their footage file. I have it separated by the times that I shot onto those cards. And so you can see that I actually shot this um, in UHD. So, um, and also in 2398, and in the Blackmagic uh, B-RAW format. So they're sizable files, but um, I, I have been able to uh, color them in Premiere uh, for the last four or five years that I've been using that camera um, and been very happy with the effects. And so- Speaking of camera, what, what did you shoot with? I know it's a, some sort of Blackmagic, just looking at that metadata, but what, what did you actually shoot this with? Yeah, so this was uh, just the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. And so I got it in 2018. Um, and so uh, a new, the, new, the new camera that I have that I use to pair this with is my uh, Blackmagic 6K Pro. And so the workflow for that one's actually a little bit different, but this, this guy is just a really great camera. And so I've loved using it. Um, I also shot a couple of, uh, shots on my iPhone to see how they would blend. And so I got the new iPhone 15 pro. And so there's a couple of shots that I just put in there just to see how their 60 frames per second, um, worked in 4k and I'm happy with, um, uh, what it did. So yeah, you can make stories on your iPhone. It's great. That's the um, one that can shoot in log now, right? The iPhone 15. That's what I've heard. I've got to figure out how to do that. Okay, that's gonna be my next question is what, what's your experience with it? Because it's, it's out of pure curiosity because it's just it's crazy how the phones are just getting better and better with the cameras. I, I, I still don't think they're going to replace like a full camera sensor, at least not yet. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious to know how that next iteration now you can shoot raw in your uh, pocket is. But I've heard good things about it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a nice tool just to have, like when you're working, especially on creative projects like this, right. you know, you're your own boss. Like you can say, I'm going to mix my iPhone footage with this high quality footage today. And we're going to see what happens. So, um, that's what happened. Uh, and I also shot all of my, uh, sound just with my zoom H six. And so just brought it out and got creative with how I did that. It was one of my first times stepping into sound effects. And so I'll share a little bit about that process in a little bit, but, um, yeah. So back kind of just to the general, uh, housekeeping things would be number one. I always, um, make a sequence in which I just drag all of my footage into, um, a timeline just so that I can look through everything. And so that's what I did here. You can see all I would do is just drag and just drop it in. Um, and I have it separated by day because I have like kind of a faster computer. I can, um, play this stuff back. And another thing that I like to do is so usually when this stuff comes in, sorry, bear with me for a second it would all come in without uh, color. And it would all come in at also 100%. And so I'll, this is just like not an effective way to look at footage. And so what I would do is always scale um, my footage down to my frame size. And so the sequence size that I'm working with in usually for most projects still is 1920 by 1080. Um, and since I shot in UHD, I can just scale everything down to 50%. Um, then I also here, I'll just delete this and show you. Um, I have a lot that I like to put on everything. It's the bounce color gen four black magic enhanced LUT. And so this is just a base that I like to put on everything to get a feel for what the footage is, um, what, what it has the potential to do. And so um, that way I can look through all of this footage and just see like what's gonna be useful in the first place. Where did and you get that LUT? Did you get that from the official website or did you just get it from someone else who just, I, I assume that's a Rec 709 LUT, right? You're just kind of turning. Um, so this is like a custom made LUT that I bought from a company, I believe called Bounce Color. And so- Bounce Color, got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's just, it's just a nice base to have, um, then to manipulate from, from there. Cause it can be really hard, you know, just if you don't have this, you, right. you have a yeah. lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I say. Usually, um, if you shoot raw, I, Premiere Pro now has the option to actually bring. So just to just kind of go back a little bit, when you bring in raw footage, you're going to see that it looks flat and it's kind of hard. Uh, to look at that. So what you can do is you can kind of put a Rec 709 LUT on it. And Premiere Pro now has the option to do that with uh, certain cameras. I'm not sure if Blackmagic does, but I know there are a ton of people that actually have their own custom ones that make it look nice. And then it's good to work from there. You're just kind of bring it up to something that's nice to look at. You know, some people call it Rec 709 because that's what it is. Like standard uh, colors on TV is just what our eyes are used to looking good. And then from there, you can kind of do your own creative LUT, which, you know, then you give it like the orange and teal look, which was very hot back in the day. Uh, but yeah, it looks like it's kind of their version of a Rec 709 LUT that just makes it look really nice uh, straight out of the bat. And I agree that, that that LUT is very cool. I like it. Yeah, yeah. And there's still like, you know, like the 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 highlights are too hot. There's there's a lot of work that um, I wanted to do even with this right. LUT on for this piece. But yeah, so anyways, I've got step one, drag everything that I've shot into this timeline, including my sound. Um, and just, you know, go through and essentially just cut out the pieces that I want. My process is usually just to make a V2 level of raising like all of the pieces that I could potentially find usable and just bring them up to the V2 um, level. And so that's basically what happens in this cold footage sequence. The next step, um, if we go back to here is that I always make a footage selects um, sequence. And so usually I'll just copy everything that I 
got in here and I bring it into here. And what I will say is that in this selects kind of sequence, I usually take this as an opportunity to kind of experiment a little bit further with the footage that I've got. Um, so you can see that this already has like a far more intense color grade. Um, and I'll show you how I got there in a second. But yeah, so basic stuff. I have the selects just so that I can easily pull from this um, space for things that might be usable. All right, moving on. The next step three would be the assembly cut. And so what I'll say in terms of this tutorial is that I, because this piece was more experimental um, and I had to find a lot of the story and make a lot of the meaning in the edit itself rather than going off of a script, um, this assembly cut is kind of hard to explain how I came up with it because it just took a lot of like pu pulling things together. Also, um, this black magic sound is terrible. Like that's what I will say is that the the mic is not super usable. Um, and so that's why the in camera on. microphone. Is that what's going on? It's just got like a constant noise in the back end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I actually I raised the gain so I could hear what was going on by 40 decibels. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Just to like even be able to know. But the baseline, it's just it's usually very painful to listen to i'll say right <laughs> yeah yeah get get a separate mic people don't use the like, in camera mics uh the no. preamps in there are just aren't great compared to a recorder like a zoom or just you know like an xlr adapter um so yeah it, it's good for scratch audio just to sync audio to a separate one um but yeah you obviously don't want to rely on something like that for your main audio no no, and uh, just because I was shooting this entirely by myself as a challenge, I just took it step by step in terms of saying, right. I'm going to get the images now and I'll deal with the sound later. And exactly. so otherwise, you know, you would have had a sound op getting things at the same time and it would have been a lot easier. But anyways, so what I'm just showing you now is kind of like the initial assembly edit of how I wanted um, these shots to kind of go in conjunction with each other to start making meaning. Um, I'm not dialing in color yet. I'm not dialing in effects. It's just kind of setting up the, the general idea and flow. And so this is where the assembly cut lives. And now what I wanted to do is show you guys piece by piece kind of how um, some of these sequences came together. So I'm going to show you the tools that I use to make this opening 30 second sequence. So just as a reminder, this is what it is. Okay, so nice. this very cool sound design. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll show you like where some of those sounds came from because they were very unexpected. But if you have a guess on what they are, I'd love to hear what you think they are. Uh, I, Adobe stock sound. I don't know. <laughs> That's my guess. No, no. I made them. I made them like in oh, my house. Oh, you made the. Oh well, you made the. Uh, yeah, the typing because you said you used the Zoom recorder, right? Yes. Yeah. So even that little, like the, the like high pitch, um, like the, the, you made that too. Yes. Yes. Good. But I'll, That's... I'll let you think about it. Cause it's Kudos. very weird. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... I mean, it's a testament to how well it was done. If I thought it was like an official sound on like a licensing platform. So nice job. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is what I'm going to show you guys how I dialed in. Um, and for reference, this is kind of the starting point based on the assembly cut. I'm just going to mute this because those sounds are painful. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so this is where the footage kind of starts off. And the things that you'll notice are that 
the tension is not really there in the way that I want it to be like for showing um, like how my stress levels are rising. And as I'm like working on text, working on um, the computer and the TV's on and this guy's sleeping in the corner. Hmm. Um, and so, and there's also like some visual issues. Um, you can see the monitor in my eye reflection and that's just a total distraction. So the first step that I'm just showing you guys here is that let's first build an opening sequence that builds tension and that represents stress, stress growth from simultaneous sensory inputs. And the things that we first wanna dial in are gonna be color and sizing. And so I am going to go into the effects controls because that's where we'll be <clears throat> dialing in a lot of stuff. And the first thing about this shot is that this was a 4K shot and believe it or not, it's harder to shoot your own eye than it would seem. Your pupil moves around a lot. Um, and so I think that because I shot this in 4K, I knew that I could come in and just frame this up and make this um, a more compelling pupil shot. Like this is where it's a little bit more interesting. And so I kind of want all of these pupil shots to be at that larger size. Cause you can actually like see the device in the eye reflection. And so that's what I thought was kind of a, a shot that has two pieces of information in it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And, and then it was, yeah, and then obviously with you shooting in 4K, you're able to scale it up and it still looks nice and crispy. So, yeah, that worked out very well. Yeah, there's usually I, I won't ever push something past 100%. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, there's one yeah, shot. Slight here. exceptions, you know, but yeah, usually not more than what 100 is. Yeah, exactly. There's one exception in this film that I did push it because the shot was a mistake. Like with the fly, I didn't know mm. there was a fly on Garuda's foot until I got into post. And so I, I went in and I zoomed in on that. But um, I, I, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, all right. So let me just double check. What are you doing this. that, Jordan? I do want to yeah. bring some love to the chat. Uh, we actually have somebody guessing what that sound might be. Um, you know, you could let it, you could spoil it now or let us know later. But someone is saying it's a it's a sound recorded in reverse. I think that's a good guess, but you let it us is. know, Jordan. Okay, cool. Maybe you could tell us later what it is so we can keep the suspense. And I see a couple of people more joining in. We see Annika. Annika, what's up? Good to see you in the chat. I see Umicorn, Oliver. Thank you all for joining us. Hello. Uh, okay, cool. Let's get back to it. Okay. Okay. So, um, diving into color a little bit, this is kind of a tense, uh, scene that I'm trying to build it's at night. And I feel that even with this LUT, this color, this color is just, it's too happy. And so, um, you know, what I would do as one of many options over in this Lumetri panel is to just bring some of the highlights and the shadows down. I would say in my experience, I would stay away from the blacks because because this is a dark scene, you start to lose a lot of detail. Um, so I usually just leave that one alone. And so already like the scene is becoming more dramatic. If you come down into this curves panel, um, another way that you could have done this and uh, in a gradient, way is to make an S curve. And so that would be something that you could use to dial in um, kind of a gradient between the lights and the darks and the shadows and the highlights. Um, but when I'm moving fast and uh, under several project deadlines, sometimes it's just easy for me to not worry about this and kind of just finesse things from here. But this is a little bit more of a, a blocky way to change the light, but I'm still happy with it. So that's one thing that I would do to this. Another thing is that since this is more of a creative project, I have a little bit more license to uh, play with the look. And so right. I actually, or Paco, did you have a question? No, no, I, I agree. It's, you know, there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to doing these things. It's, you know, I, I think that's a good thing to emphasize that 
this is a creative project, so you're allowed to kind of play with whatever it is. And I love how you phrased it, just kind of a license to just be creative and push things. You know, again, there doesn't have to be a right or wrong way. It's, all, art is subjective. So yes, very, very good call out. Yeah, yeah. And as someone who works in the brand world, um, those restrictions can, you know, that's what I work in every day is like restrictions and trying to be um, on point for all like the commercial looks. And so this is a space where I can go, you know what, we're going to have some fun. And yeah. so, yeah, I dived into these looks panels for um, the first time in a long time, just to see kind of, uh, nope, don't want to browse, uh, what built-in effects might make this more of a unique world. And so all that I'm doing is just, I have my cursor over the looks panel and I'm just scrolling up and down. And so it's already showing like, many different, you know, unique looks that artists have built that you could turn your world into. And so I'm trying to see, I think the one that I landed on out of many is one that's way down in here, but it's like the matrix look. We like the matrix look. Not the matrix green, but we're close. Matrix, ooh, that is very matrixy looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, Matrix Mars. This is the one that I liked the most. I thought that it did a really good job with um, making the shadows deep, but also that it's not super scary and you still can like see a fair amount of the details in some of the shadows. Um, and it kind of helps make the, like some of the, the highlights a little bit less intense. And so once I've done this to this shot, um, the thing that I'm realizing is that the, the, the key character in this film that I wanted to keep as a detail in this wide shot is kind of missing. Like he's all in darkness on the couch. And so what's important to do um, is to leave this as a base layer of color and then find a way to bring him back into the picture as an important detail. And so what I would do is go down into a bin that I've called VFX. It's not, I don't think it's technically a VFX, but just for organization's sake, I, I make a, uh, new item, um, and put in an adjustment layer. And so it's the same size as my frame. And um, this lives in my VFX bin, so I know where to find it. And I just pull it in on um, right over the, the layer that I'm working on and make sure that it's the same size. Uh, it doesn't really bother me that it's under this shot right now because um, it just is not impacted by this shot. So... Um, let me see, what would I do? What I wanna do then is go into the effects controls. And my goal with bringing in the, this adjustment layer is to bring out the shape of the dog so that the viewer knows that he is also in the shot. And so you have your effect controls open and you are in the Lumetri scopes for, or the Lumetri color for this shot. And let's just see like how much um, highlight it would take to get him back in. And so now we hopefully see that there's somebody on the couch. And so I brought up my highlights a little bit, but I also brought my contrast down a little bit because it's just kind of hard to see the shape of his eye and bringing the contrast down kind of, in this case, seems to help bring out his face a little bit more. And I brought the shadows up as well. Um, and so you don't want to leave this adjustment layer fully over the shape of, uh, or the entire screen, because now you've just brought all the light back in and you don't want that. So you can go in and you can make a shape. And so I don't, that doesn't really bother me what your base layer shape is, as long as you can kind of create, um, a mask that is going to make sense for 
what you're trying to to show. And so these masks are very malleable. And so that's all that I did was um, make a circle mask. And then I just use the Bezier, I believe that's what they're called, the Bezier curves to kind of shape this around him. And so yeah. now we're at a point. Oh, sorry, Paco. Yep. No, 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 I was just confirming. Yeah, the Bezier curves. That's what we, that's what we call them. Awesome. Um, this doesn't look very good. And so what you're going to want to do is um, just bring your feather like way up. And so now like you can barely tell that there's a mask there. Um, and the, the feathering is something that you could spend time finessing to the point where um, it just kind of blends in with a shot. But now we've got a shot where um, I'm more in the darkness that I want to be in. And also Garuda is now a much greater detail than he was with kind of the, the heavy look that, that I applied. All right. So we would take this adjustment layer and just make sure that uh, copy pasted to the correct layer of where we needed it to be. But I'm actually going to de delete this for a second. OK, so something important that I want to point out about my color process is that um, if you find the look that you want and you're using that shot later on in the film, you're going to need to get rid of this kind of base look. And so I'm doing this in kind of a hodgepodge way because this is such an experimental kind of film and I'm kind of piecing the idea together as I go. But just remember that you're going to want to um, remove the just the lumetry color so that it doesn't um, end up getting doubled um, from here to here. So what I'm doing is I'm copying this color and I'm now just pasting it onto here and make sure that nothing else is clicked on. And so now I guess you could just drag the adjustment layer through. So now you have these two shots that are consistent. The, t the television was on when I did this, which is why it's kind of flickering on in the background. So anyway, so that's how I picked out kind of the color for these opening shots. I'm just going to cut this up because there's something else that I want to do. So we have this shot. Let's see. Um, trying to get this to... So I think... Another thing that I did was that I might not have been terribly consistent in the application of the look. And the reason for that is that I use two different lens types on this film. And so this was shot on a Sony 14 to 24. And so this was shot on a Canon 100 millimeter macro. And what I found is that even between those two brands of lenses, the, the way that the light like hits the sensor can be just drastically different. And so I usually need to treat color, coloring between the different lens, lens types differently. And so I just kind of play with the effects to the point where it all looks like the same world. Um, and so I don't think that I applied um, the Mars effect in the same way to this shot. Um, all right, so let me play this through and just see where we're at. These shots, though, were all shot on Sigma, and I do want that um, look carried through. This is a 100 millimeter macro. I'm gonna put that up there for a second. Is that still the Canon, the 100 millimeter macro? Yeah, so these this was all just that actually the same eye shot. So I'm going to come back to that shot in a second. Um, what I want to do right now is just make sure that my base color for all of these uh, Sigma shots is consistent. And that's the meat of this task. And so what I would do if I know that I'm changing the color is to 
select like the clips where you want that color gone. And so, and just make sure to replace this. And so I'm copying it from the look that I do want and pasting it in. And so I really like the way that like this matrix, Mar matrix Mars look is um, very yellow, but it is pretty dark on the hands. And so I would probably go in and play with this effect. <coughs> and something to think about is I have chosen a very um, yellow look. And I did that because it's going to differentiate kind of between the night world and the human world and then the natural like blue dream um, dog world later on. And so I've left this in the very tungsten um, space. It's also very dark. I think that I'm gonna leave uh, this about where it is right now. Um, and move on to, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> just need one sip of water. No, please. That, that's a thing here on Adobe Live. We encourage everybody to take sips of water, whether you're on camera or watching, because you know, talking for about an hour and a half is a long time. So please take <laughs> as many water breaks as you can. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm happy with the base color of these Sony shots. And I want to dive into kind of um, something else important that's going on here is the um, reflection of the monitor in the eye. And so instead of going into After Effects, which m might have made this an easier task, I'm going to do something right here in Premiere to get rid of that. And that's just going to be simply taking a color mat. I'm going to match the color of the pupil. You can see that it's not pure black. It's got um, some of that yellow that's hanging out like in the room. Um, and we're going to apply that to this eye. And so right now it's gone, obviously, because it's a full screen. But if we go into now the effects panel, I'm going to make a circle. And this circle is just going to be basically the same color as the pupil and cover up this thing. <coughs> nice. So okay. sorry, Paco. I see what you're doing. <laughs> no, 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 don't apologize. <laughs> okay. And so now this is momentarily gone, but like I said, and like I found, had the hard way of finding out is that human eyes move a lot and they move at like a very high frequency. So you know, you can't just leave that right there. But um, what you can do is start at your first frame and you can drag this within the opening sequence uh, or this, uh, the program panel. And I'd maybe make the, the feather a little bit larger over here in the effects panel. And the thing is that the, the size of the pupil changes which makes this extra fun but starting at the beginning of your um the, at the beginning of the the clip you're going to keyframe your mask path and just find the point where you can drag this and keep the thing covered up <coughs> And so it's a little bit of a tedious process to do it this way, and there are faster ways to do it. But I'm just, sh just showing you this so that you know that it's at least one way to have this happen um, because it's such a simple fix in this case. Yeah, the yeah, good old keyframe in the solution to many, many things. <laughs> so, okay, so now you can see we're almost there. There's just yeah, that, that one really little. Good. Yeah, I mean, if you wouldn't have told us that there was a color mat, or solid over that it'd be really hard to tell that's a very good effect on it thank you it's a yeah an easy yeah so okay there's a little bit more playing that i could do with this to get this to the right um shape but if you ever do this in the future 
you can take the time to kind of finesse this mask path. Um, and you would do the same thing for this eye, but you can, um, I actually probably wouldn't um, copy and paste this color mat because this eye had such different lighting um, uh, settings when I shot it. I used the phone for one instead of um, the laptop right here. And so <coughs> the laptop is just like blasting the eye with light. Yeah, that's like it's a, its own light source almost. Yeah, especially at full brightness. I think that's actually all that I used. And then over here, what I thought was interesting was that, you know, if you just play your phone, it's blasting you with so much information that's constantly mm -hmm. like changing that um, there's a way to make your pupil change size. And so I thought that that was um, worth diving into. And so... Yeah, I think the brighter eye, it is, the more the pupil dilates, right? I'm not going to pretend to know eyeballs, but I think that's what happens. Like an effect you see is like more light, it dilates. And then when it's darker, it gets bigger to try and get more light in there. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I shot this at night. And uh, so figuring out how I wanted uh, the, the white balance to look, since there's A, there's just this phone coming in. Um, just want to get it eventually to a point where it uh, at least kind of looks like it could live in that world. So you have these two shots, and then what would your eye look like? And also, can you see the information that you want to see? Um, and it's just tricky because it was such a, a dark shot. But I would probably get um, this light up a little bit more. And then if you wanted to go in and um, grab the, the look, you could bring that in and try to um, get it as close to this look as possible. But it was just, you know, these are uh, kind of difficult things to match. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we've done some of the key things that I wanted to do on this. And the next step for kind of building tension i'm just gonna grab this cool just a quick time check jordan we got about a little over 30 minutes left in the live stream okay i'm gonna try to get through this opening sequence and then dive into some of the dream sequence cool then if you want to take another sip of water or anything feel free to do so yes. doing good <laughs> awesome yeah we're making good time here i like it okay so we've seen the eye get fixed up we've got the color on here some color definitely could use some dialing in but um okay that's not the right map we're just gonna ignore that what i think would help build some tension here is using the fact that we've shot this in 4k to do a small zoom in. And so because I, I've added this adjustment layer on top, something that we can't do, or let me see if, how it'll look. Yeah, see the adjustment layer, if we were to do a small zoom in, um, the adjustment layer would also, would, would not move at the same pace. And so what I would prefer to do for this is to take the adjustment layer and the clip and make a nested and sequence. Nested, yes. Yes. So it all lives in this one little container that we're making. And so all the effects applied to it affect both clips instead of individually, which can cause all sorts of headaches. It can. The one thing that I think that I actually am not knowledgeable, not, not knowledgeable about is that now that I have this nested sequence at 100, how can I scale it in? That's where I yeah, think Yeah, well, you that... can scale it in right there. Um, I, I don't know either if it's actually going to break the resolution. You know, it's kind of like an After Effects. You can rasterize something so that it's it's lossless. Um, I'm not really sure how Premiere handles that, so... 
Yeah. Okay. So now that I'm backing up, um, I'm just going to do this as a nested sequence right here, but um, this may not be the best way to do this. But the point is that I'm only scaling in to like 104. So from right. 100 to 104. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I think if we do it this way and it looks good, I mean, I know we're at full resolution here. Um, you know, if it looks good to the eyeball and it's not crazy, then I would say it works, right? Obviously, if there's crazy degradation of quality by doing it this way, then I think there are probably better ways to optimize it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I like to do it, especially for creative projects, you know, like if, it, if it's not too distracting and it looks good with this effect, I'd say let's do it. Great. We're doing it, Paco. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it live. <laughs> Okay, and so I'm going to start the effect um, right where this eye shot ends. And so I find that up here in the positions in the position um, timeline and just use that keyframe. And I'm just doing a very little zoom, um, big zooms. I think you need to have a big reason to use them. And I do use them in parts of this film that we'll get to. But for right now, we're just looking for like that little creepy dolly push in that kind of increases the tension and it tells your viewer where to look. So I'm just gonna push in. And that's just a little push in. And I would probably go in and I would make a push in here as well. And um, yeah, so I think that I've gotten through the effects in this um, part that I wanted to get through. And then this is where, you know, we've fixed the pupil, we've um, decided on the color grade, and we've made the dog a greater detail, and we've added in some zoom in effects. So I'm just gonna show you where we're at with those changes. Well, when you do that, can you make the program monitor uh, full screen, please? Yes, it is uh, hit tilde, right? Uh, yeah, so you click on the program monitor, so it's got the blue, so click on that window. There we go. Now you hit tilde, which is right under escape, and it should blow it up for us. Okay. There it is. Awesome. Thank you. Nice. And I, I realized, folks, that it's looking a little choppy, probably on our end watching it. So I was hoping hitting the tilde key would make our uh, our gathering app that's working behind the scenes to get a better frame rate. But it looks like it's a little choppy on our end. So just a heads up, Jordan. Okay. Nothing you can do about it. But I acknowledge, just so the viewers know, that it's just not playing back at a full 24 FPS. Um, and that's that's just on our back end software. So, But the changes are still there. So we can still see it. Great. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is we have this big long shot and there's a ton of negative space. And I shot this intentionally knowing that I wanted to fill this negative space with um, a representation of what was going through my head. And what's going through my head is all of the text messages, all of the emails, all of the things that are going on in the news and just pile all of those sensory inputs into that dead space. And so that's why I'm framed kind of to the um, right of the screen um, to leave space for this. And so what I am aiming to do, I'm just gonna re remind you that this is what I'm trying to build. So how do we do that? We have this big empty space. And so what I did is make a, um, let's see, a graphic assets uh, bin that I could use to drag in whatever visuals I wanted to put in here. And I actually made this thing I'm calling the message box. And so this is a fairly simple process, but, um, in Premiere, it can get a little bit tedious. I made this message box actually in Photoshop so that I could get the the edges curved. Um, but another way that you could have done this is obviously just by making um, a color mat as an option B. 
And so in the effects controls, you can go into scale and unhit the uniform scale and dial in how you would want this to look. And so I just didn't prefer like the hard edges. I thought that the soft edges made a lot more sense for modern media. And so I custom made this, this message box and I made it blue. And the reason I made it blue actually, instead of just um, white is because I wanted to use the blend modes more effectively. Um, and I found that if you just um, choose a color, like if you're gonna use the blend modes to blend um, text or anything, it's it's more effective and more interesting if you use it colored rather than leaving it um, like gray or, or black or white. This is a more fun thing to do. And so if you just move through like the color dodge, like this is just interacting with the colors in the shot like so much more um, compellingly. And so going in and just finding whichever one you like the most and then bringing the opacity down. Um, that is how I kind of came up with this message box. And so the next thing to do once you've kind of picked out what you want that message box to look like is obviously to go in and add some text. And so by hitting just T, I select um, the space that's right over the box and we'll just write, hey, see you later. So you, did um, you make all the text boxes and the text, did you do it all in Premiere? Well, I know the, the layer came from Photoshop, but all the text you stacked it and made it all in Premiere? I did. I did. Very and cool. So I, was, I was wondering how you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sticking it all in one app. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm trying to keep it as much in this app as possible. It just makes yeah. life easier. <laughs> it does make it easier. I agree. Yes. Um, and so we need to get this font more in the space of the box. And so, okay. Don't want that. I'm trying to get to my graphics panel. Yeah. All right. So I'm going into essential graphics and right now this is text is highlighted and I would just go in and let's just pick out a more, um, a different font that looks more like you would get from a text. And so I'll just pick Helvetica regular and scale this down. and I'd probably just plop it right in the middle of the message box. And so now we've got this and s what we can do to make this mix, may maybe even a little bit more, actually, you know what? I'm going to leave this as white for a reason because I want it to stand out. But what I might do is just bring down the opacity a little bit. So it will kind of blend in a little bit more. Um, and so now we have one message that's kind of creeping up into her head. And if you hit Command D on a Mac, that's kind of just going to add in this like simple fade. And so there's one box. And if you want to make this headspace like way bigger, what I ended up doing was adding in tons of these up here. And so they all say different things for a variety. And so layer by layer, I staggered how quickly they came in, used the cross dissolve in varying different um, lengths of time. And so they all fade in and they fade out. Um, right. In, uh, yeah, like the that's random. A cool, that's a cool workaround to do in um, kind of like an opacity, uh, like, keyframe kind of bringing it down this this is a way quicker way i've never thought of doing it this way it's cool i love the cross dissolve yes yeah. um what's annoying about this process obviously is now you're dealing with 19 layers and <laughs> yeah, we don't want right. to do that <laughs> so i took all of these and just went to nest the layer uh, and so nest. yeah it's smart to name these things. So maybe we'll name these like text 
headspace. And so what you'll see now is that we've lost the blend effects. Um, they're all kind of, um, they only kept the, the opacity effects. And I'm fine with that because now I can just go back into the effects on the nested thing, on the next nested layer, and just pick out whatever I want that to be. Um, I think I picked hard light, or I picked out one of these. Um, and just so you see, or I'm, I'm just checking which effect I use. Color dodge. I used color dodge. I like that one. Color dodge, it just helps integrate all the yeah. colors together. It gives it a little bit more transparency and blends in. And it's still kind of fading in at different points, so it's not all uniform. So the desired effect is still there. Very cool. Yes. And what I'll say is in this nested effect, um, like these all stay... Um, with their blend modes, but there's nothing for them to blend onto, which is why you don't see the um, effect show up over here um, in the the layer that it's on now in this sequence. Right. All right. So what I thought would be cool would be to actually double this um, nested sequence and use it to just make the the effect more dense. And so I staggered this. And so, and I also want it to be a little bit different. And so I made the scaling larger. So now you can kind of see this headspace is just becoming a little bit overwhelming. Right. Yeah. And let me see if I did a different effect. I did a screen effect. So we're kind of just mixing these effects and bringing down the opacity so that they look blended. But the key to making this look not just like crazy is actually to go into your effects panel and use a blur effect because there's just too much going on. And sometimes the blur is a cinematic way to literally help focus your information. And so what I did was I added the, I typed in blur in the effects panel, grabbed the Gaussian blur, um, dragged it over to the uh, clip, and now you have um, this level that you can use to kind of decide how blurry you want this to be. And it's a very just cinematic way to add layers because it, um, you know, is kind of the the focal point like in cinematography like with lenses you're just kind of adding that into the scene in, in a more organic way and so i would just take this and kind of finesse this to a point where things just start looking like they could possibly exist in that world and i'm going to show you where i ended up And that's kind of like the final effect. So, um, you know, uh, make your layers and then also nest your layers and then play around like with timing as well as like the blur effect. And this sound, I think the last step of kind of pulling this little opening sequence together is the sound effects. And so if you start from scratch, I'm just gonna, you're, this this is um you know like i i think there's some cool visuals but if, as soon as you add in sound like the world is gonna become a lot more interesting oh yeah yeah don't sleep on sound design i would say you know as you kind of get more and more into video production if any of you all are starting out you'll see that sound design is really what kind of elevates and take and brings the production value to uh to any video just that much more i mean sound design is, is pretty dang important once you really start getting into the weeds of professional video production absolutely and that was a hard thing to learn coming from the cinematography world that yeah, same you're, you're... I'm, I'm a video guy I, I don't mess with audio uh but you know as i was you know I've, I've done a lot of personal projects like these too and you know i've had to that's one of the things i realized i'm like i need sound design so Kudos to you, because you went above and beyond making your own stuff. I was just licensing them. I was taking the easy way out. <laughs> well, this this was good encouragement to know, like, how many of the professional sounds just come from your household objects. So yeah. 
this um, effect. Yeah, I'm so I'm 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 dying to know. How did you get this? It's water. So it's literally water, water falling into a cup and then played in reverse. So wow. if I yeah, let's take this back to um I'm just we'll take this back to what it was. I think I think Nicola Stein was the one that's saying it's a sound in reverse. So you were you were on the hot track, my friend. Yes. So you poured this. water and then played in reverse. No more. I mean, it's so funny the things that you can come with sound design, you know, even thinking of how they made, you know, like very famous movies like Star Wars, how they made lightsaber sounds, you know, it's just kind of distortion noises warped and then you get this iconic sound. So, yeah, it's I, I, I love the the creative um, liberties of just being like, what can I make in my own house? And then, yeah, I mean, there you are just kind of doing it all. And that's the whole kind of thesis for your for your video, right? So it's all stuff that you can make in your own home. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is that I, I was totally not thinking that anything was going to come of pouring a glass of water and then bringing that in as a sound effect. And so this is going to be very fast. It's literally that sound. Actually, okay, so that's actually, uh, sorry, this is a cup that's, um, I think I put on the counter. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. that's the sound of it is it that's played in reverse. So this is the cup. Um, I chunked this out. So we go to command R. Uh -huh. reverse I reverse speed. the speed. And so there it is. Okay. Very cool. But I additionally brought this down to 20%. And so it ah, just like. Very cool. It's crazy, like that one that little crazy. thing. Yeah. yeah. And so it's encouragement to just like have fun because just knowing that these things that we think are very synthetic are actually just fun or experience. When you recorded that cup being put on the table, were you fishing for that specific sound or were you just kind of experimenting, doing that? And then you're like, wait a second, this sounds kind of like a zoom in effect. And then you yeah. went with it. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it was going to be the zoom in effect until I like, Played until you played did it, it. right okay. yeah that's funny how that's... those happy accidents happen that's when i do personal projects too i'm just like let's start working with it and then you know it's kind of cool it's like this puzzle that you start like things start working when the more you work with them yeah especially on something that's like more in this creative zone where there's mm -hmm. no roadmap there's no dialogue there's really no narrative um and just seeing how can you make something hopefully make some kind of sense or meaning at least um right and so um that's how i ended up using that and to me it just it makes sense because the the sound moves like with the pupil um contracting and so that's why it was a good place for that but yeah. another yeah like thing that i like to do is um typically always add um a crossfade at the beginning and end of my clips um or the cross constant power yeah and that's just with the the shift command D I have my default sent set to one, two, four frames for this. So if this were applied to two different shots, shift command D, it would be two frames on each side. Um, Cause I feel that the default, like, I think it's like, it's a very long, it might be like five seconds or, the the de the original constant power default is very long, so this is much shorter for everything. Um, yeah, and so let's see what other sound effects I used. So those, it, it kind of sounded like the same effect, but did you change maybe the pitch of it? Like, did you put in like a EQ effect and just kind of change the frequencies? For the most part, the only thing that I did was um, change the speed that they're playing at. Change the speed. Okay. Yeah. That does give it kind of like different pitches based on the speed. So yeah, yeah. working smarter and not harder. Nice. Yes. Yes. Um, and then, you know, there's basic typing things. Those are easy. And then... That is, um, that's paper slit, um, that I ripped in half. And then just, I believe that I played this at, 
Yeah, 30%. So paper, it is just kind of like added to that idea of uh, like mental buzzing and mm -hmm. fracture. And so it seemed like a good creative thing to put there. But if you play this at 100, I guess it's still pretty effective. Yeah, a lot quicker, but it's there yeah. too, I'd say. Yeah, but I like my the, uh, opportunity to just mess around. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so what the... What was that? Was that the same effect? Let's see. 15%. I'm going to like play this. Yeah, it's just a glass oh, it's, clinking. It's, it's another one uh, being put down. <laughs> oh, I love how many, how much, how many dividends you got from just putting things on a counter. <laughs> recording it. That's so cool. Yeah. So anyways, that is the opening sequence. Um, and then if you think we have time, um, I can, I'll show you this next little part of the film so that it connects to um when we go into kind of the the dream worlds or if there's any part of the film that um seemed the most interesting to dive into like the effects for we could do that instead yeah but. we so quick time check we don't have a lot of time left we have 10 minutes so i would say um maybe the next cool effect that you um want to show us that you think was cool then we could do yep. that might not have time to do it but maybe we could just kind of dive into the weeds of how it was done so yeah we got about nine minutes left cool all right so let's see the fly. Yeah. All right. So there's a part in the film. I'm just going to show you this. Okay, let me let me switch it up real quick, Jordan. Can you go back to the video that you originally showed? Just because mm -hmm. it's a little choppy coming in from Premiere. It's not on your end. It's just the way it's coming in through the live stream. Can you just play this sequence real quick on that one? And then just yes. make it full screen, and then maybe we can get some smoother playback coming in here. Yes. Okay, and then I got it full screen. Okay, so then go ahead and play when you're ready. Okay, so that's the part um, where I've dived into what the perspective of um, this blade of grass would be. Because um, the science is showing that these guys might just see um, light and dark. So it's it was kind of just crazy for me to know that the plants might actually be watching you. Yeah. Um, and actually, I have a comment. I'm going to throw in an even more curveball here because we do have a request from the chat. So first of all, we have uh, Palash saying, wish we were we had a longer time. This is terrific. So thanks for joining us. And then we have Nicholas requesting you could show us the fly effect. So that might be cool to do in yeah. the next seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. So we get to the dog. And so I've just applied this zoom in effect. And this is where I broke my rule. Um, yeah, I had a feeling it was this one. <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't know the fly had landed on him until after I'd finished shooting. So this is at a thousand percent. Um, I wish it was better, but it's really hard to convince flies to be good actors. Um, <laughs> so we have this basic shot of a tree and I've colored this in the way a human would see it originally. Um, and then I've clearly applied some effects that kind of change the shape of this. And that's because flies can see in black and white in a blurry world and also their viewpoint is um way more convoluted or, or it's way more 360 than ours so let's see i'm finding a good base point to do this from let's pretend that this is colored i'm just going to show you the effects that i use uh so we're going going to go into 
the effects panel. And in the video effects, there's going to be, I believe it is lens distortion. And so I dragged lens distortion onto this clip. And now you can do some cool things where you're messing like with the curvature. And I'm pretty sure Premiere invented this so that if you're like shooting on a very wide lens and um, the edges of your frame are warped, you can go in and fix that. But we're going to use this creatively like as a transition. And so what you would do is let's just say we're in the human sphere and now let me bring this back to this is what it would be at zero keyframe that drag it out and then we'll go up to a place where it's kind of we're just showing that the world is is changing shape for for a fly um and so when you play that it's it's short um and what i wish that i had done was play was recorded in 60 frames per second so that this effect um, could be better keyframed. But um, if you drag this effect out, it just gets very stuttered. And I hope that the 60 frames would have solved that. Um, right. Yeah. And so- yeah, No, but it's still there. It yeah. kind of reminds me, I think it's called like the Hitchcock zoom, but you know, I think the fact that they don't do it in post, but the effect is on a camera when you do a dolly zoom, but you also zoom in on the lens at the same time. It looks like, you know, the person is centered, but everything around them is warping. And that's kind of what this uh, effect reminds me of. It's very cool. And so you can see how to achieve it in post. Yeah. And then you got to have a good reason to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But when um, we have the license to remember, we, we have the creative freedom. And yes. obviously we want it all to make sense and have some narrative behind it. But yeah, I, I think it definitely works in this in this instance where we're, we're perspective hopping into the fly. Thank you. Zolly, uh, yes. Claire Haynes, what's up, Claire? Yeah, it's called the Zolly effect. Hi, Claire. Just, uh, okay. Um, yeah, and just to, like, finish this up, this is going to bother me, so I'm just going to bring the highlights down. And this is what I wanted the dream world to look more like. Just, like, bright human colors. And then as soon as you go into... The beginning of the lens distortion what i would do is hold on gotta hit my project files and we're just going to bring in an adjustment layer and i'm pretty sure that you can use the same adjustment layer without having the effects copied from the last time that you used it and i would just bring in um you know what? I'm actually just realizing that this is not how I did this. What I actually did to change the color was to cut up the file um, at the midpoint and then um, drop the saturation down. And so if you just add in um, a cross dissolve there. Oh, look at you. Another fun hack. Yeah, it's like keyframed, but through that cross dissolve. I like it. Yeah, that whatever makes it easier and just makes more sense in post. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that this would need to to reach like the idea of being a um, fly is just the blur effect. And so I think that I briefly touched on that, but the Gaussian blur is just a tool that I've used a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But here. It's just to mess up his um, eyesight because he can't see right. Right. And so now you're in the fly zone. And so, <laughs> yeah, fly zone. that's what I would um, change this perspective to um, uh, get that fly look as well. Um, but that's where this would come from. So, Very yeah. Cool. I like it. We did it. We showed you how to do the fly effect. Uh, but that's actually perfect timing because that's going to pretty much wrap us up here. Um, so Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. That was really fun. Uh, we had a lot of people in the chat saying how informative and how awesome it was for you to break it down for us. So thank you. That was a lot of fun. That was very original, creative work. Thank you so much thank for bringing so it on much. Adobe Live. 
Yeah, cool. Um, in the meantime, nobody go anywhere because we have Beta Beat, a sneak peek of a sneak peek of what's next in Premiere Pro uh, with Kylie and Ryan, I believe. So don't go anywhere. Um, this is a cool new show we're doing where we're kind of giving you some uh, high-level sneak peeks into what's coming in with the latest version of Premiere Pro. So don't go anywhere. That's coming up in about five minutes. So stick around, everybody. All right, this is where we say goodbye. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you again, Jordan, for showing us that. And we'll be back in about five minutes. All right, buddy. Thanks, See you later. Bye-bye.